It's a time of celebrating what we have. 
And this past week, I had a bit of deja, deja vu. I don't know about you, but you know, some things are just triggers. This was one. As you might have known, I've been sick. Tyler covered me last weekend. What, what happened is I got this um, nasty virus or whatever, and about six, seven, eight days in, I'm like, it's not going anywhere. What's going on? And immediately I start getting this panic sense because I've got these really sharp pains right here in my liver area where it just takes me directly back to a year or so ago when, when you know, I had that incredible, uh, they found that virus that had destroyed a large portion of my liver or was eating away at me. And anyway, I was feeling the same symptoms. And after a week of it not going away, and I'm like seven, eight days in, I'm like, I'm going to call the doctor. I was like, please call the doctor. Well, she was the one who said it. I didn't say it. And I just said, okay, finally, like most dudes, it's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine until you're not. And then so I called, got the, the doctor wanted to see me. I went in and saw the doctor. And the next thing you know, because of my symptoms, the fevers, the aches, and all the other things that were going on, I'm back in the tube. How many of you know what the tube is? You ever got cat? And think about who Nero was. Nero was a guy who was basically a big time party guy. He was a wild and crazy guy, had numerous public affairs. He thought himself a great actor, so he put together a drama troupe and he would perform for people and nobody dared not applaud because they were terrified for their life. They feared him. Basically, he bankrupted Rome. He spent over five times more money for gifts for his friends than what it cost to maintain the entire Roman army for a year. He ran it into the ground. He became insecure in his leadership because people began pointing out his flaws. So he began murdering anybody who got in his way or became an obstacle, including his own wife, his mother, and a brother-in-law. A stepbrother, I should say. In July of year 64, we know the great fire that broke out in Rome that torched 14 of the 17 districts of Rome. So the majority of Rome was burning. And some scholars and historians believe that Nero was responsible for it, but it's not proven, it's not clear, but as a way of covering the fact that he had bankrupted the country and got it into great trouble. And what Nero did with that is he deflected the blame from himself for the fire and all the damage that was going on to the religious sect, that group, that had started with a little group of 12 or so guys and had now grown to where it was literally popping up all over the Roman Empire, turning communities upside down. This little group called The Way, their leader was a man who they'd crucified named Jesus. And usually when you get rid of the leader, you cut off the head, the serpent dies, but they were saying, man, this one's, it's like you slam a, you know, you slam a hammer on, or a sledgehammer on a burning log, and the sparks just went everywhere, and it's getting worse, it's not getting better. So he turned the blame on the Christian, and then they began to torture them, kill them, martyr them by the thousands. Historian Tacitus describes these atrocities, he said, Covered with the skins of beasts, Christians were torn apart by dogs and perished. Or they were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burned alive to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. And it was very well known and documented that Nero would use Christians as human torches to light his evening garden parties literally running a beam right up through the backside of Christians, dipping them in a, a flammable substance, lighting them in fire just as amusement and light. Folks, when we talk about what's going on in the Christian world, the brutality that was taking place right when Paul was writing this, it maybe gives us a little more a little more perspective about when Paul's talking about something that should bring worry and concern. How many of you are worried about walking out of here getting burned alive, fed to dogs, torn in half? How many of us have to stress over the fact that if we declare that we are followers of the way, our neighbors will turn us in and we will be publicly ridiculed, we will eventually be arrested, and death will probably follow how many of us have those kinds of stresses? No, but we have our own stresses. And eventually, the tension of the Roman leaders was so great that the Senate had called him a, declared him a public enemy, and he was run out of Rome, and he committed suicide at 30 years old. 
But this is the world, this is the climate, this is the leadership we find happening when Paul sits down to write what it means to follow Jesus in tense and difficult times. So when you read these words, think of the world that you're in and the stress and the trouble and the conflict, and then think what it means to be a person like Paul who is so free to just take joy in every moment because of his beliefs. Here's what he believed. He said in Roman, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to break that down a minute because how do we live lives where we can be full of joy? How do we live lives where we can just be abounding in a sense of well-being of our lives when we're in the crisis moments and times of worry? First thing Paul says, refuse to coast into that spot of worry. Refuse to coast into worry. And here's what I find most of us. He says, don't worry about anything. And, and worry in the Greek, literally, merimnao is to be anxious about, to have care, to take thought, to let something occupy your mind that leads you to stress or anxiety. Anything like that in your world? Here's what we've discovered. We talked about that in a former series. Most humans don't realize that when your mind has gone into neutral, when you don't have an active thought which you are working over, and again, it's not that we don't have concern and we don't have to process and we don't have to figure out problems. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, but there's that place that we go when we get that overwhelming sense of, ah, oh, like, oh no, or like, what am I going to do? Or like, I don't know how to handle this. I'm so stressed. Paul was saying, hey, that moment, it's, it's usually not because you have wake, woken up in the morning and you're like, you know what? I've got a few moments before I have to go to work. What can I worry about? You know, I, I got a light. It looks like I'm going to be here for a few minutes. So how can I stress? What do I need to be anxious about right now? Who should I be stressed? I, I should probably be worried about something. It's not that we do that. It's, it's the fact that the human nature is that we naturally just coast into it. We just kind of move in that direction of negativity and letting the things and the problems of our lives come back into focus when we have a moment free. Paul's saying, knowing that tendency, don't let your mind drift into the negative, into worry. Don't let your cares like just kind of eclipse the joy of life, the goodness of God, and the delight of living with Jesus. Don't let it happen. Don't worry about anything. We feel uneasy, upset, or stressed without even trying. We just coast there. And he's like, stop the drift of negativity. Stop it. Don't allow it. Don't allow that worry. And wait, he means, right, don't worry about the big things, right? I mean, just, just trust them. No, he means don't worry about anything. I looked it up in the Greek, and anything means anything. Don't, don't stress about it. When you worry about something, guess what happens? It gets bigger. Has anybody ever criticized you? And at first, you're like, you're all defensive, or like, like well, you're wrong. You know, there's something obviously wrong with you. Do you think that about me? Because I know who I am, and whatever. You defend yourself. But then, later, to yourself, you're like, well, what, you know, you start thinking about it and it starts getting under your skin. Pretty soon it's like, I bet they're talking to people at work. You know, those people have been acting a little bit different to me. And all of a sudden it's a conspiracy and everybody's talking about it and you're the bad guy and you, it grows in your mind. Things get bigger. And, well, she hasn't responded. You know, she hasn't texted back and it's been like almost three seconds. And I, I haven't heard back from that person and like, I wonder what's going on. It must be a problem. We've got something going on. I mean... Well, there was that time, this thing, and you just, when you start worrying about stuff, it just gets bigger and bigger, and it eclipses everything else. Why? Because when, whatever you focus on grows. And by the way, that we've learned this over the years, this is a physical fact, you were not born a worrier. You learned it. You developed a habit. It's brought into our family structures. It's brought into our world. And the good news, if you learned how to worry, you can unlearn how. You can take it away. If you learned how to do it, you can learn how to stop doing it. We can learn not to. After all, worry is unreasonable. It's unnatural. It's unhealthy. I told my 90-year-old grandma one time, she used to worry wart. And I just told her, Grandma, don't you know that 95% of the things they 
statistically proven, 95% of the things you worry about will never happen. She goes, see, it works. <laughs> Sorry. Grandma, you missed the point. <clears throat> anyway, it's the idea that it's unhealthy. Our bodies are not equipped for the stress that comes from our worries. You know, if anybody ever said, oh, man, I'm worried sick, well, you are. That's a physiological effect. Emotional side effects we know, anxiety, chronic worry, panic attacks. But did you know that worry triggers all kinds of physical side effects? Headaches, stomach problems, blood pressure elevation, chest pain, insomnia, irritability, irritability. You living with a cranky person, ask them, what are you worried about? You're stressing me out. You're, you know, sweating. We'd, we'd put those guys out of business if we quit sweating so much. Just quit worrying, right? L inability to concentrate. Add to the fact chronic worry and stress hormones that are introduced through that destroy our bodies to have serious consequences, including suppressing our immune system, digestive disorders, muscle tension, memory loss, coronary heart disease. All of this stuff, it's directly linked to the fact that we just ball it up inside. And I heard somebody say, it's not so much what you're eating that matters, it's what's eating you. And if what we basically, what we don't manage, what we don't deal with, what we swallow, what we stuff down, literally turns to a bomb inside. So we go back and forth like a rocking chair. There's a lot of activity, but no progress. We're not going anywhere. The only thing that worry does is it changes you, makes you more miserable. It's stewing without doing. It's ineffective. I, I love, when, when you think about it, worry cannot change the past. Your past is over. It cannot control the future. The only thing worry does is contaminate the present. It brings this yuck to the moment that you're in right now. And as I'm laying in that stupid, you know, gurney, and uh, they're saying, okay, Mr. Elmore, it's going to be a little bit, and blah, blah, blah. We're going to inject this stuff. You're going to get this hot flash, and you're going to taste metal, and it's all this. As I'm laying there, I'm like, here we go again. And, it, you know, immediately I'm thinking, oh, man, I don't have life insurance. What am I, you know, I'm thinking all these things that start hitting me. I'm like, oh, you know, am I prepared for what's coming? And, and, and you just go there. And you have to, you have, literally have to stop, 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 stop. And I had to literally tell myself, stop. Here's this passage for the week. Don't worry about anything. There's something bigger going on. It's not that it's it isn't maybe not real or there's not a problem, but there, there may be. But basically, worry comes from a misunderstanding of what God is really like and what's happening in the world. See, you're a part of a redemptive story that happened eons ago before you came on the planet. And your one little cultural moment, your one little slice of time is all that you have, so you're really concerned about it. It really matters more than anything else in all of the world to you. But not to God. God has more children and more experience and more time. As a matter of fact, eons passed. He'd been here all along. Into the future, he's there too. Our misunderstanding is that God doesn't have control of things. Sure, he gave the world to humans and told us to take control, to care for it, to oversee it. And he's allowed us freedom, and our freedoms hurt each other. They hurt us, and they hurt... That's just a short in our wire. Sorry, that happens every now and then. They're not telling me to shut up, but... <clears throat> or maybe they are. Sorry, it's God. But basically... <clears throat> Worry, it basically just takes our eyes off of God and it helps, it really causes us to think God doesn't have this. Either He's not loving or He's not powerful. Either God can't do anything or He's not willing to do anything. I'm in on this, I'm on, on my own in this. And that brings us to that place where then if God isn't in charge, I better take charge. I better control things. And it's hard to be in a relationship with somebody that you don't trust, isn't it? It's hard for somebody who knows they're not trusted to really love. Because when you don't love somebody, when you don't trust somebody, it affects the relationship. When you don't trust somebody's driving. If I were to say, Lori, you know, no, I got it, I got it. Yeah, but I have a driving license too. I can help. No, no, I've got it. But, but you've been driving for eight hours. We're on this road trip. And it's like, I've been, you've been, yeah, I know. But, I, you know, sure, I care about you and I love you. But I just don't trust you. I, don't want you, I can't give you the wheel. I have, to, I have to stay in control. That's what we're doing with worry. We're saying, God, I can't trust you. I've got to hang out. I've got to be in charge. I'm not sure what you'll do with this thing. I'm not sure. You'll run me up into a problem. I'm not going to let go. And so worry, you have to stop, stop, stop. Don't worry about anything. 
Then what? Replace your worries with prayers. He says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. When you start to panic, pray instead. And I've said it a dozen times. Turn your worries into prayers and give them to God. Paul's just saying there's a natural, and and this sounds so simple that we forget to do it. We literally just bypass this and go straight back to worry, back to, I got the wheel, I'm going to take care, I don't know what God's up to, but he's not involved here, so I'm going I'm to take over. Philippians 4, 6 through 8 tells us, when these problems come to your mind, don't waste time worrying, but get busy praying. Tell God what you need. Because doesn't that just indicate right there, Paul's experience is like, what I've learned in all of my shipwrecks, I was stoned and left for dead. Stoned as in, they put you in a pit, they throw rocks at you until you're dead. He said he was left for dead multiple times. He was beaten, he was flogged, he was shipwrecked. He was saying, and all these things, I learned that actually God is still good and he can be trusted and he's got a bigger plan for my life. So I just pray about it. I take it all to him. If it isn't worth praying about, it isn't worth worrying about. If we'd pray more, we'd worry less. If what we prayed, if we prayed about everything, we wouldn't have to worry about it so much. Because prayer changes things, worry doesn't. So when you start to worry, stop. And, and here's basically my little remedy. Here's what I did, what I'm doing, what I practice. First of all, I just stop and I breathe. You know, sometimes just a deep breath is so cleansing. Ah. <sighs> And when I breathe, I just release the tension. And then I pray. Say, okay, God, you know what's going on right now. You know what's happening in this part of the finances or the personal life or this person's story. You know. You know my problem. And then I trust, repeat. So breathe, pray, trust, repeat. Breathe, pray, trust, repeat. And that just brings a sense of, oh, man, God, you're in charge. 1 Peter 5, 7, give all your worries to God. Give all your cares he cares about you give all your worries and cares to god because why this is peter the guy who rejected jesus and then became the the leader of the church he's like because what i've learned in all my failures and all my bad decisions i've learned god's still crazy about you god still loves you give it to him sometimes i wonder if some of my problems aren't just sometimes god's way of just reminding me that he's there and i need him I, I was just reminded yesterday, um, Lori, Lori's playing with Onyx, my grandson, he's the cutest kid ever, just if you wanted to know, and they're playing, <clears throat> but what she'd do is, is she would pound on the floor and go, ah, like she's going to get him, and he's just, you know, and then of course he wants to run and hold her, ha, ah, you know, this is, it's a game. You scare them and they hug you. It's a great game. I mean, this is, this, it works, and I've, I've tried it on my kids, and what I love though, when my kids were small, and there was something that scared them or something that worried There's something that they weren't sure about. They weren't feeling well. Man, that's the time. They wanted to cuddle. They wanted to be close. They wanted to hold on. And I just can't help. And I, I couldn't prove this theologically, but I just wonder sometimes if God just misses our desire just to draw close and just to get in tight and just to say, God, I need you and I, I care and I know you care about me. So I just want to sit in your lap for a minute. I just want to draw near. I just want to get my attention on the fact that you really are my father. And you care about me. I just, I just need a hug. I wonder if God doesn't sometimes just look at our problems as ways to allow us to draw near again. Next, remember to give thanks. Final and simple. Give thanks. Thank Him for all He has done. First Thessalonians, another letter that Paul wrote, he said, rejoice always. In other words, man, just, just let your joy explode. Just be a joy explosion. Just always be quick to celebrate the good in the world. Be joy-filled, right? Pray without ceasing, and then what? Give thanks in all circumstances. There it is again. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Just give thanks. Clearly, thankfulness is like part of what it means to follow Jesus. It's a big part of walking in the way. And when it comes to becoming good at something, we said this all last series, practice makes perfect. What you practice is what you become. It's not what you feel that changes your life. It's not what you even think. It's what you practice. It's what you practice. It's what you practice that transforms you. Thinking healthy thoughts, great. Not going to fix you. I mean, it's going, when you practice, and for me, this whole year, I've been like practicing healthier things, eat juicing and eating, you know, all these 
healthy smoothies and taking care of myself, resting, sabbathing, all these things. And so you get to that moment, you're like, okay, I'm doing all my part. Now I need to just be thankful. Add to that gratitude. It'll change your life. David, uh, Ryan L. Rast, I'm sorry, Steinel Rast, is a Benedictine monk, a thinker, a philosopher, and he, he basically was a, did a TED Talk on the subject of gratitude. Been viewed over five million times. Here's what he said. It's not happiness that makes you grateful. It's gratefulness that makes you happy. It's powerful. We don't become grateful once we're happy. We become happy once we're grateful. This is so powerful. We all know people in our lives that have arrived, <clears throat> or at least are in that position where we thought, man, if I could just get there, I'd be so much better off. I would be happy. I'd be less stressed. I'd be less, if we could just get, if I could just have, if I could just arrive at, we all feel like there are people, we see people in our lives who have that, and they're not happy. And you're thinking, but I'm different. I would be. But are you now? I remember, I remember when I was, you know, starting out as a youth pastor, and I got my first, you know, paycheck, and I was, you know, making like 20000 a year, and having, I had a family and all this, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, $1,100, that's amazing. It'll be nice when that can actually pay the rent, but it's really a good start, you know, I'm like, I'm so excited, I was like, this, man, if I could just make, you know, 28000 I'd be rich. If I could make 30000 if I could, and I was looking at that earlier days, and I'm thinking, man, and, and uh, after the kids had gone, you know, to school and all that, and Lori went back to work, and it's kind of like, finally, we got to that place, and I'm like, but now I got all these new problems, and I got all these new expenses, and, and I'm telling you, just having more stuff does not make you more happy. It just makes you more stressed, because you got to worry about your stuff, and now I got to have a garage, because I got to put all that stuff somewhere. But what I'm saying is, the point is, be thankful Gratefulness right now, right now, whatever you're going through. If you're in a prison cell in Rome awaiting your standing before Nero, or if you're just in a job with a really cranky boss, if you're in a marriage with a somewhat unappreciative spouse, if you're in a family where your kids are kind of out of control, or if you're in a situation where you're single and you don't want to be, and you don't know what to do because you feel like time is passing, and God's saying, listen, I get it. I see it. I care about it. And I want you to, in this moment, recognize who I am. and Celebrate that. Worship is just celebrating the good that God has brought in the midst of whatever you're going through. That's worship. That's gratitude. That's thankfulness. And because gratitude actually leads us to happier, more joy-filled lives. I, there was another TED Talk. My family loves TED Talks. Lori was talking about this one. Dr. Re Brene Brown, she's a research professor who spent um, 13 years interviewing and surveying people, like, like 11,000 people, she discovered every time she found somebody that she said was living a full and joyful or a happy life, what she called a full-hearted life, they had these characteristics. These people were given to gratitude. They were full of thankfulness and appreciation, and they practiced gratitude as a choice, as a discipline on a regular basis. They practiced gratitude. Those were the happiest of all the people she ran into. Constant and continual. Those quality traits were in all the happy people she met. I'm just telling you. When you start practicing thankfulness, you start giving thanks daily, you start lifting up some of those areas of your life that you just want to give God thanks for, it, it just literally lifts the clouds out of your view. Things change. It's a practice you can do every day. Thank Him for all He's done thank him for all he's done. And I just think, if you don't know where to begin, can I recommend, take the Psalms, all right? If you've got a Bible with not a whole lot of stuff in the back, like all the helps, if it's just a regular Bible, you just open it right in the middle, pretty much you're going to land somewhere in the Psalms. Psalms are songs, or, or they're poetry written about and to God. David wrote a whole bunch of them. And David was a guy who was literally running for his life. And when you start reading the Psalms, you start reading about a guy who was running for his life, who was literally crying out to God, God, please be aware that my enemies are lying about me. They're doing all these horrible things. God, strike them dead. Get them, Lord. But in the middle of this, I worship you. In the middle of all my pain, I cry out to you. And I realize that you are my source of life and you are my source of joy. And when you start reading these things, it's like, man, it frames it for you. It puts it in a whole new light. Not only that, but I've learned that worship music really helps. I'm, I'm not a big music listening guy. I mean, I love 
you know, like orchestral music and symphonic and all the stuff without words, um, jazz or whatever. I, I really like that stuff because I'm ADD and I'll get distracted if I hear things sung. And so, but Tyler, he's always listened to worship music when he prepares his messages. So, I mean, I started getting in the habit of listening to worship for a while and literally just having the right music in the right time, it just soothes your soul and just brings it back into perspective of how good and how great and how amazing God is. And it just kind of frames it for me. Another one that I do is I'll take a drive or I'll take a walk or I'll be in nature. I'll sit and watch the sunrise. I'll just pause for a little bit at a sunset. I'll just look at all the trees that they go down that are changing colors. And it just brings joy again. It just brings me back to this God. I mean, every single day, you call the sun to rise and it rises. And all day long, you watch over creation and you give life and breath and food and care and sustenance to all you make. And God... It's amazing. And every night you cause the sun to go back down and we get to celebrate once again your goodness. And then you cause me to rest so my body can recover. And you're in charge of it all. While I'm awake or while I'm asleep, you're in charge. And God, you're good. Every day I can celebrate this. And if you don't know what, you, what else you have to be thankful for, let me give you a final reminder. Paul told his friend Titus this. Letter to Titus, Paul says, When God our Savior revealed His kindness and love. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins. Guys, he washed away our sins. If you want to know what happened when you did that thing, and that thing that's haunted you, and that thing that you can't, and that addiction you can't kick, and that stuff that's just still kind of lingering, and that junk that just kind of clouds your soul, and it reflects badly on you, and if anybody knew, oh man, that he's saying, it's like I brought the fire hoses from heaven and I just blasted the guilt and shame and the judgment of that away. It's all been placed on Jesus, right? He washed our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and He gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. We can give thanks for a lot of things, but as we wrap up today, He wants you to know that to, to just take over all the other stresses of your life, he's taken, advantage, he's taken care of the things in your future that you worry about. The ultimate issues of your life, God said, I've got it. I've got it. And I want you to know that when you place your faith in Jesus, when you become a person who has signed on, just truly trusted Him with your sins and your past and your failures, knowing that those things are a violation of God's plan, knowing the Bible calls them sin, that that has literally caused death to you and the relationships in the world around you. Your and my and our sin brings death, but He said, but the gift of God through Jesus Christ brings life. That's your opportunity. In Christ, those who are in Christ, who abandon Project Self, I'm going to make myself good enough for God to like me. You abandon that and you just throw yourself in the mercy of God. He gives you forgiveness. He secures your past with God's, with Jesus' blood. It's been washed, you've been made new. He secures your present. He pours His Holy Spirit in you that leads you and guides you and prompts you and encourages you and teaches you and counsels you. And He secures your future. He gives you forever in heaven. This is the story of our great God. It's what He's done. And in Philippians 4, 7 finishes that whole text we started with. If you do this, stop worrying, start praying, start thanking, guess what? You will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. His peace will guard. It's a military term. It's literally one who posts a sentry to make sure things are kept the way they are meant to be. God says, when you treat, Paul's saying, when you live this way, that Great God is going to post a sentry in your heart and mind that's going to help make sure that you stay continually in the presence, the care, and and the faith of Jesus. I want to close today in prayer. And what I want to do is I want to practice this right here. As we close, I want you to bow your heads with me. 
And I just want you to take whatever it is that's taking your mind away from life and joy and relationship and health and happiness and all the good in this season. I want you to take that right now. And just as Paul said, I want you to give it to God. That by, the Bible talks about that where to cast our cares. That literally means to throw them, to get rid of them in haste, to get disemburden yourself. So I just want you to picture yourself just like handing them to God. God, what it is right now in my mind is this, and here it is. So let's pray together. God, as we close, every one of us has our stresses, our concerns, the things that weigh us, burden us, stress us. And today in a world that we live in, there's more than, than usual amount of stress and worry with what's going on relationally, politically, spiritually, racially, morally, all these things. God, we got so much. And we just want to realize that it's your world and you are in the driver's seat. And we're partners with you. But God, we want to give you all our cares, our worries, our stresses right now. And I myself am handing you mine, God. As the rest of us do hand theirs. We invite you. We invite you in. Folks, it's important that you name them between you and God, that you name them and you just call them. This is what I'm giving you. I'm giving you that relationship situation. You know, I'm giving you this problem. I'm giving you that thing I did, that thing. And you just give it to him. And some of you, what you need right now is more than anything, you feel prompted that you don't have a relationship with God and that you're learning, you're growing, you're open. But now today, you feel prompted that it's time to step in faith in the direction of trusting God with your life and it's it can be as simple as just making your first step you don't have to know everything but you are prompted and God is opening your heart then here's your opportunity you can do it with a prayer maybe just between us you could just these are the words and you can use your own but God I just give you my life I open my heart and my life to you I ask you to come in forgive my sins my trespasses my failures do like the scripture said, that when I open my heart to you, you come in and wash away my past. You wash away the guilt and the shame and the judgment. I won't face it because Jesus did. And I put my trust in you and I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit, like Paul said, that I can now live a life rejoicing no matter what. Lead me, Lord God, and teach me to follow you. I place my faith in you in Jesus. See